In this video, we're going to look at the overall code structure we used for the combat system in the Godot OpenRPG 0.2. Things might change a little bit in the future, but that's the state of the system at the moment. And we're doing that because interactions between nodes in a real game are complex. And the first step to understanding the individual nodes and systems that we have is understanding how they all tie in together, seeing the big picture. So that's what we're going to look at. It all takes place in the combat arena scene. So in the file system, you can search for combat arena to find it. And like most of the files that are specific to the combat system, they are in the combat folder. And combat arena is at the root of this folder. So this one brings the background, the various UI elements that interact in the battle system, the spawn positions for the characters. But before that, we have to go back to the game scene because this is what handles the flow of the game with the main game node. This is the one that's going to start dialogues, to start the battle, to go back to the map that we can see on the screen. So this game node has a combat arena scene preloaded at the start of the game. The combat arena is not added to this scene by default. It's when we start an encounter, so when you walk into this monster here on the map, the game node will receive a signal and then it will call this enter battle method. This one is going to play the transition animation with the transition color that we covered in another tutorial already and it's going to add the combat arena it's going to remove also the local map from the game so it's keeping them in memory but it's going to remove local map so you can't move the characters anymore and it adds the combat arena so it swaps the active game in a sense and then says okay combat arena you take control until the end of the battle that's essentially what's happening. So onto the combat arena that has quite a bit of code as well. Okay, so now in the combat arena, if I go to the script, it all starts with the initialize method. So let me go back up to the top. The game node is going to pass in two pieces of information that allow the combat system to work. The formation, so it's the monster formation in this case, and the party. Formation will have the different monsters, but also their positions on the screen. So it's going to add the formation, like the positions, to the spawn position node. And the party is the current characters that are available in the player's party. And for now, we only have two spawn position on the map, where you will have character one and character two. It takes the party order in account as well. The combat system, when you start the battle, it's going to do a few things. So it's going to play the intro, then set itself to active, and then start to play the first turn uh, after it's set up the field. So after it's added all the characters on the game, the battlers and the enemies, it's going to clone them, to instance them from the code directly because your party might change, the monster formation might change, so you can't know it in advance. That is why we don't add the nodes in this combat arena directly, but that we instance everything from the code to make it as flexible as possible. Now we can look at the play turn function, so that's really the heart of the battle system. Up until the very end of this function, until line 122 here, it's only doing setup work. So first, the function is going to get the active battler from the turn queue node. It's going to initialize a few values. So basically, it checks if there are any targets. If the character is dead, it's going to skip the turn and move to the next battler instantly. Then we set the battler to selected. So when it's selected, it's going to blink on the screen to show that it's selected. It's going to get the targets as well. So same thing, uh, get targets is a, another method we have here that's going to return uh, either the monsters or the party, depending on whether the active battler is a party member or not. So that's how you differentiate monsters and characters. Again, we have an overview of that out there. So I invite you to check the video for more information. The interesting part happens here, line 110. So if you have party member selected right now, it's going to give control to the interface. So the player has to select an action and 
one or more targets in order for the battle system to apply that action. For example, so you have to first select attack, then select a monster before you can attack enemies. For that, this combat arena node is going to delegate control to the combat interface twice. First, it's going to open the actions menu on the interface. And this actions menu is the circular menu you can see on the game with the different actions the character can pe perform. Then from that, if you select an action, you're going to select a target. And here's the one of the interesting things we have. When you are coding like that in a function and you use yield to stop the function's execution and create kind of a timeline of how the battle turn is supposed to unfold, you have this problem with going back in time, which object-oriented languages are not so good at allowing you to do. So what we do is, if you don't have any target, if you cancel selecting a target when the arrow is on the screen, the function is going to continue and see, oh, there are no targets, so let's play the turn again. And uh, we didn't play the turn on the turn queue, so it did not consume that character and change the order of the battlers on the game. So we just restart the turn. This is how we allow the player to undo their actions at the moment. However, if the player selected a target or if when the AI is done selecting a target, we let turn Q play the current turn. Uh, we give it the action the player wants to do and the list of targets that the action is going to be applied to. And so then turn Q takes the control. So it's a direct child of combat arena that holds all the battlers, all the characters that are fighting. Again, we have a video dedicated to it, so I invite you to, to check it out. But that turn queue is going to apply the action, the various steps in the animation, moving to the enemy, applying the attack, and then moving back to the starting point for the attack command. So the battler does its action, and then we go back to the combat arena and reach the last two lines. If the battle is not over, if not all the monsters or all the party members died, it's going to play the turn again. Let's talk about how the battle ends to finish that. So in the play turn function, when we get the opponents of the active character, for example, Godette is it's Godette's turn, if all the monsters in front of her are dead, the player won. So it's going to call the battle end method and end this function. So when the battle ends, we get the active battler again so that it doesn't rely on play turn returning anything. It's all self-contained. So we check if the active player, the player that was going to attack on the next turn, is part of the party. If so, it means that the player won and that the monsters are all dead. If the player won, we delegate some work to the reward system that's going to give the player experience points and the UI is going to show the items that you earned and we emit the battle ended signal, which is going to be caught by the game node here that's going to do the steps that enter battle did kind of in reverse, so it's going to remove the combat arena and it's going to add the local map back. Uh, it keeps doing that in the same enter battle function, which really be play battle or uh, you know run the battle because it handles the entire battle from start to finish in a linear fashion here. We do have a few uh, commands here. So when the battle ends, if the player did not lose, we copy all the data from the battlers that got some rewards back to the characters in the party node. So that even after we remove the combat arena, the data related to the characters is stored on them and that we can reuse them on the next battle. So if they leveled up and all that stuff, it's all stored in there. That's it for the overview of the critical path of the combat system, the overall flow of the code and how we set its architecture. So we try to use different nodes to handle specific code, to split it across multiple files so we don't have too big of a one huge file with all the functions that operate on the battle. Hopefully having it in multiple nodes like that helps to understand what's happening a little better. Do we have a turn queue that handles the turns themselves, handling the order in which the characters will attack? and the combat interface, although it could use the circular menu here. So you know that there is that circular menu. 
we're going to keep improving the system. That said, if you have any questions about specific things you would like us to cover, please tell us in the comments below. The code is entirely open source, so you can go check the project, contribute. That said, for now, I'll just tell you to be creative, have fun, and we'll see one another in the next one. Bye-bye.